um, you often have multiple buyers. Buyers buy for multiple reasons. Um, and some are emotional, some are rational, um, you know, the left brain, right brain kind of philosophy that's there. Um, so they are looking at who their target demographics is. They are looking at what their decision process is like. They're looking at what their goals are like, and they are positioning accordingly at, and assuming the position is correct and accurate and they're not lying. <laughs> Welcome to Making It to Market, the podcast where we discuss everything about taking your product or service idea through to commercialization. I'm your host, Dahlia Collada. Are you delivering on your brand promise and actually doing what you say you're going to do? How do you know you actually have something that people want? And how many times has your customer come in contact with your brand before they buy? Today is all about marketing and branding 101. Information links and a transcript from today's episode are available in the show notes. Let's get into it. Joining me today is an industry expert you have got to meet. He has four decades of branding, marketing, and sales consulting experience across more than 240 companies, ranging from startups to multi-billion dollar publicly traded global entities. His expertise is not just B2B, but also B2C, and has supported a variety of industries, including manufacturing and distribution, technology, healthcare, professional services, financial, energy, retail, and nonprofits. He is also a speaker, teacher, and writer, and continues to be recognized for his creative genius by industry associations, not limited to the International Web Awards, American Marketing and Advertising Associations, Addies, which is like winning an Oscar for the advertising industry, and major publications such as Inc. 5000 and Fast Tech 50. If you like what our guest has to talk about today, you can learn more on his company's marketing podcast called Solving for B. You may want to check them out. He has been the co-founder and partner at Brand Extract for nearly two decades and serves as chairman. Jonathan Fisher, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I would like to know how to have a great brand. What advice do you have for for people who are maybe just starting or maybe thinking about rebranding? Oh, uh, wow. That's a great question. <laughs> I'd have a great brand. Uh, you know, brands are built off consistency of the promise. So it, at its core, a brand is a promise. Um, when you experience that promise in a positive way repeatedly, uh, the brand grows, it gets built, and the reputation is measured against that. When it's inconsistent, uh, the exact opposite. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're going to start by building a great brand, you have to start by thinking about what is the brand at its essence? Uh, what are your strengths, what is relevant to the customer and how it's going to differentiate in the marketplace. And then how is it going to be experienced? Because that consistency is through that experience of that process. So that I think for, those are largely the fundamentals that you want to look at when starting to think about how you're going to build a great brand for yourself, for your product, for your service, for your company, whatever it might be. Wonderful. So how would you define a brand and who's responsible for a brand? <laughs> Uh, these are going to be tough questions, I can tell. <laughs> I know, putting you in the hot seat. <laughs> so let's talk about um, all three that you used in the introduction. Let's talk about branding, marketing, and sales. I think that's an easy way to help define brand in its context. So a brand by its uh, Webster's definition, I think, would be defined as a mark. You know, it is uh, something that is distinct. It is to create the impression thereof. And so branding at its core is the essence of the product or service of the company, the individual, whatever it might be, as defined through that distinction, through that identity, if you will. So within the context of branding, you sort of have people think of it as the brand identity, which is literally the logo, if you will, or the trademark, uh, can be the name, those items that personify and visualize the brand itself, even the voice, the sound, You know, brands have sounds, you hear that jingles all the time and whatnot. Um, So you have kind of the brand identity itself. You have the brand strategy, which is the positioning. Um, That is that union and intersection between what your strengths are, what is most relevant or needed by the customer, and what is differentiated in the marketplace. And so if you visualize a three-legged stool, each one of those legs creates stability and strength. And if you visualize 
a Venn diagram of three circles where they overlap in the center, that is the best, strongest possible strategic brand position you can achieve. Uh, obviously, you don't want to market things you're not really good at, and you can be great at it, but they don't really love it or they don't really need it. You kind of wasted your time. And if it's not highly differentiated, it's not truly branded and distinct in the marketplace. So thinking about the brand identity, thinking about the brand strategy, and then thinking about that brand experience and how all the touch points and all those interactions will occur in that process, which is where then the marketing and the sales differentiated pieces come into that conversation. So marketing, I think, is classically defined as sort of the act of bringing uh, or the process of bringing the product to market, if you will. And in school, they'll teach you the four P's that, you know, you have the the, the product, uh, the price, uh, the, the place and the promotion, right? And so if you think of it as essentially identifying the buyer needs, uh, setting the price points, developing the plans and the processes for which you're going to bring it to market through the channels, uh, franchising, distribution, whatnot. Those are all acts of marketing and, you know, and then promoting, you know, how you're going to get it out there uh, through all the different events, activities, giveaways, you name it, uh, of which advertising is generally considered a subset within the marketing process itself. So advertising is essentially the act of, promoting within that category largely, but drawing attention to it, right? The advertising there of the product itself when it's out there is primarily paid historically in the past on, 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 on paid media. Um, these days it can also be a little bit other. Yeah. The other, the social media is the other. Right. Which tends to fall, you know, some people put it in the marketing category, some people differentiate in the, in the, in the advertising category because uh, there is paid on social as well. But generally, the distinction of, of advertising and marketing is advertising is generally that subset within and largely is, is defined in the paid space for the most part. It is about influencing that behavior of what they will think when they see or read the product as it's promoted in the marketplace thereof. So it tends to fall into sort of um, categories and stages of where you go through awareness, you go through understanding and, and knowledge, you go through uh, preference and liking it. Um, and then you go through sort of conviction of action or call to actions and and purchase thereof, and then even loyalty after that. So people tend to categorize ad, uh, advertising into these categories of like cognitive, effective, and 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 uh, uh, cognitive in in that regard. So you kind of take those um, those stages and then group them into those categories. You, you tend to have an advertising strategy that falls along those plans. Of that activity of that activity but is like man that sounds so overwhelming so <laughs> <laughs> okay break it down just just say you know brand is the essence right? okay. it's defining who you are strategically marketing is that process of deciding how you're going to take it out there right the product the pricing and the promoting and the act and the advertising is those 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 awareness activities that you do to to, to advertise and market that product thereof so if I can simplify it down for you. That was good. Think that of, was better. Think of that. Think of it as that <laughs> journey. So. Well, yeah. it's interesting. I've got three questions that came out of what you just said. Um, oh, okay. you, <laughs> you mentioned touch points. What are touch points? Well, I, I define touch points as every place somebody can encounter the brand itself through that entire process. So, and, it, and it's basics. It's, it can be anything from literally opening the package. Is it is it easy? Is it difficult? That's a touch point. Reading instructions, that's a touch point. If it's interacting with your, with your website, that's a touch point. If it's filling out a form, that's a touch point. If it's talking on the phone with a sales representative, that's a touch point. So um, all of those are touch points that determine the failure or success of that brand experience. When I was in school, they said seven touches of marketing. What is it? And not, people are telling me now it's not. Like, what? what is it? What's the correct answer? Well, um, I like to think it's no less than three. It's tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you told them kind of a philosophy. I do think that because um, we receive hundreds, if not well, literally thousands, I think the science says thousands of messages every day through all of the channels that we interact with, TV, radio, billboard, magazine, or smartphones. Um, that you do have to have multiple touches uh, for your message to stick. 
um, the more relevant or the more disruptive or the more unique, the more likely it is to be memorable and to cause action. Um, another reason for multiple touches is frequency. I might not be in the right state of mind at that right moment and that right time for that right decision to be made. So one and done may not catch me in the right sequence. You know, think about an oil change happens every 3,000 or 6,000 miles. If you're marketing, if I just got my oil changed, I might not remember in mm -hmm. 6,000 miles your coupon. Mm -hmm. So frequency yeah. of touch. It's, so timing is a factor for this. Um, state of mind is a factor for this. Uh, noise and confusion is a factor for this. So uh, generally, yeah, you need uh, multiple impressions. Some channels are more impressionistic than others. The classic example is, you know, uh, Apple and ran their commercial in the Super Bowl only once, and it had millions of impressions thereafter. You know, when they came out with their their Macintosh, I think it was um, back in the '80s. So highly memorable, incredibly distinctive, like nothing else before. And so their impressions were formed by the marketplace, not the paid placement during that one time, you know, launch of that. So impressions can be viral, impressions can be paid and unpaid, um, impressions can be reinforced and richened enriched 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 <laughs> I don't know <laughs> enriched richer as they go uh -huh. uh, enriched so you can deliver some information and then build on it and then build on it and then build on it and build on it right you don't have to tell your story in one shot so it depends on what you're kind of going to market with what that strategy is as to how you might choose to do it uh -huh. um and then approach so but generally yeah you're going to need multiple impressions Generally, those impressions are going to have to take into consideration the frequency and the timing and the state of it. Um, there's a whole science to when. Um, Daniel Pink has a book out on when, you know, when it's all about the timing of things. Uh, really interesting read, not a really long or big read for that. Uh, fun read for your listeners to go look it up. Daniel Pink, he's got a number of books out there. Um, so like when is the right time to make a sales call? When's the right time to go in a pitch, you know, first or last kind of thing. Oh, uh, uh -huh. uh, you know, whole, there's a whole science to that that's been studied. Um, so yeah, uh, one and done generally not a good idea. You know, uh, I see companies all the time there, you know, Hey, we've got the, you know, got, you can get the cover at half price or you can get this ad in this magazine at 60% off. Do you want to buy it? And they're not willing to advertise any other times in that magazine, you know, but the broker called them up with this deal of a century mm -hmm. and the client calls me up and says, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't think it's a good idea, no matter how cheap it is, because that one impression is likely not going to accomplish what you want, right. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, now is doing one trade show going to accomplish what you want? Maybe rather than doing eight, if you're spreading your resources too thin, you know, um, you, can you triple your leads at the show? Yeah, if you think about the impressions before they get there, when they get there, and after they get there, rather than just at the show. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often we're collapsing clients' activities down because we want um, we want to concentrate those impressions. Mm -hmm. We don't want those impressions to be strung out too far apart necessarily, or we want to concentrate them at a point where they're in the state of buying mm -hmm. at a trade show somebody might be in a state of buying that's why they came to the show to learn about something they're particularly interested in at that moment in time um so i want to control their activities at the show i want to control their activities before the show mm -hmm. and even after the show so yeah it's too much pressure for the brand creator or the product creator or the service creator it's a lot of pressure well Oh, it's, think of it as an opportunity. It's an op yeah. it, through that entire customer journey, there is always an opportunity to affect their experience and and make it different, make it fun, make it memorable, make it distinctive. Um, that's that's what gets people super excited about this whole process is thinking about how you can, you know, affect that process. We like to say you don't necessarily control it. Um, you know, you manage it. 
Um, I can't control whether somebody opens the package right or wrong. <laughs> I can't necessarily control if they click on the wrong thing, but I can, uh, but I can do my best to manage that experience so that it's easy to use. You know, if you've been to somebody's website and you had a horrible experience, what happens, right? You don't go back. <laughs> it's kind of the old adage. Yeah. If you go to a restaurant and you have a horrible experience, you tell 10 people well, these days with social media, you tell 10,000 or 10 million. It's over. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, people generally uh, share negative experiences, you know, five to 10 X more than they do positive experiences in this process. And so you want to think about that brand experience. You want to pay attention to that because it has the potential to, you know, to really amplify the brand one way or the other, depending upon that experience and the impression that it's left with. So, well, let me ask you when it comes to the touch points and you mentioned a variety of them. When, how do you know which touch points are appropriate and the frequency for each one, or should somebody focus on, you know, say three methods or, or the, is the mix of all of them ideal? What's optimal? Well, I would say generally, uh, there's an 80, 20 rule where about 80% of what you think matters doesn't <laughs> and about 80% of what, uh, <laughs> That's funny. what truly matters does. <laughs> in that regard. So uh, using that law of averages, um, the trick is to figure out what are the 20% that matter. And there are methods and studies that can be performed to help you arrive at that decision. But the main thing I think is to look at the data, uh, to do your homework, uh, to do interviews, to do research, uh, to put testing in place. There are a lot of methodologies to arrive at, the, at, that, uh, at those factors. But essentially, if you have a dollar to spend, how are you going to divide it up and where are you going to focus it? Um, because you don't want to spend a penny in a hundred places. Well, that's where the strategy and expertise comes from, from somebody like you or brand extract is, you know, that's why you exist. It's not, it's to support these other companies that need it and don't know the direction. And you come in and you kind of guide that process from a strategic perspective with that desired goal at the end of this. It's not like you're just, aiming around and just doing everything and just seeing what sticks. It's all methodical. Like you said, there's data, there's research. It's, it's a, it's a science, it's a science and an art. It is a little bit of both. Um, you know, uh, their quantitative studies will often give you statistical relevance. Um, whereas qualitative studies will sometimes yield the unique insight. Right. The, the one genius idea that nobody thought to bring up. So when you looked at the data, it doesn't show up. Mm. And so the art is distilling out the differences between those two and bringing them together in that process. Um, another term you might hear thrown around is customer journey mapping. Mm. So essentially, it's, it's looking at all those touch points that are experienced along that journey and then understanding what it is that you want them to think, what it is that you want them to feel and what is it that you want them to do. With each of those interactions, I like that, and you can lit and you can literally diagram that out. You can yeah. jump online and search the terms "customer journey mapping." You'll see a lot of visual maps for that process that are out there. Sounds very uh, fun, <laughs> but yeah. I, but and, I think like that too. So this is exciting. <laughs> and think about you know all the different stakeholders, right? You might be thinking just uh, external B to C type of consumers, but you have stakeholders which are internal as well, so employees. Um, there is a journey map for recruiting somebody, for example, or um, there is a journey mapping for getting somebody to necessarily repeat or reuse or cross sell or upsell. So you can apply the methodology to a lot of different situations um, within the process. And I often say that branding starts from within um, long before it ever gets to market, because if the employees can't talk about the brand properly and articulate yeah, it agreed. and demonstrate it and create those positive experiences from what, you know, consistently through whether it's the customer service process or the packaging of the delivery of the service itself. Um, how are you ever going to expect the customer to get it right and to understand it and to, to do it properly? So you often start this process from within the own organization itself and evaluating the company much the way a management consultant would go in and look at the company. Um, to say, okay, you claim you're fast, you sell me fast is important, but wait a second, are you really fast? <laughs> and then you go and say, does fast really matter? Mm -hmm. Is it the thing that customers most want? Yeah. They might associate fast as being sloppy or cutting corners. 
in your mind, it was genius because you had this innovative technology that made it quicker, but maybe it made it so fast that the customer doesn't believe it. Wow. Right. Yeah. So you have to be careful and you have to look at that, that Venn diagram model to ensure that you get all three of these pieces really lined up the right way. Tell me the three pieces again on the Venn diagram. So internal, external, and competitive, essentially. Think of the three-legged <laughs> stool as right. your strengths, what you're really good at, and you want to understand essentially your weaknesses too because you don't want to make a mistake of promoting something that you're technically not that great at. Which you see, I see that. I'm sure you see that all the time. I do too. We do see it all the time, right? You know, (laughs) if I just take face value what the CEO tells me or what the CMO tells me, it's generally, you know, it has some truth to it, but it also has a few, a few, uh, a few, uh, uh, let's say rose colored perspectives. Yeah, I guess, process. I guess that's where fake it till you make it. So maybe they'll create yeah. that persona and until they become the persona, yeah. right? Yeah, my software's amazing. <laughs> There's no bugs. We install it flawlessly. It goes seamlessly perfect every time. Yeah, I don't know. Let's go talk to customers and find that out yeah. if that's true or not. And I, I have <laughs> the best thing in the market. Nobody else has anything like it. Well, how do you know? Have you tried every single one to compare to make a statement oh. like that? It sounds hokey. Well, yeah, we're really unique. Wait a second. I just found four companies that look exactly like <laughs> you or all, sound exactly like And they like say you. that they're unique. And they say they're exactly like you. So there's a lot of noise in the marketplace too. I mean, you can be crystal clear on what you have, yeah. but that doesn't mean the competition isn't lying and creating the noise in the marketplace. So therefore, that differentiation piece comes back in on that third leg. Mm-hmm. You mentioned social media earlier and how that's kind of... I don't know, maybe, you, I don't disruptive is the word, but it's definitely, I've seen the progression in, you know, when I went to school, I studied traditional advertising and social media wasn't a thing. And now you're seeing that transition to where social media is its own life form. How challenging is that um, to implement? Is that part of the strategy um, or is that just a mandatory, everyone has to have social media? Well, I would put it this way. The conversation is going to occur with or without you. So you might as well be there. Mm -hmm. You might as well participate. Um, I liken it. uh, I would used to tell uh, CEOs this story back in the day when social media was first invented. (laughs) Uh Um, I'm not going to date myself. (laughs) Well, I dated (laughs) too in this conversation. (laughs) But, you know, uh, I would have conversations with CEOs that would say, you know, what is your social media policy? And their policy would be don't. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Or or we or we block it, you know. And and I said, that's interesting because I watched everybody carry around two cell phones. (laughs) When I (laughs) do you realize what they do? So they don't do it on your corporate, you know, account but they do it on their personal account. And it's, it's essentially what you've advocated for is everybody's carrying around handguns and you're not offering training or safety. Mm. You're yeah. just denying that they're carrying them because you can't quote, see them. <laughs> well, I've seen too in companies where the marketing w- wants to control the social element so tightly that there might be an opportunity missed maybe at a trade show or some other function networking event that could be promoted somehow. What do you think about rogue (laughs) employees doing social media? Oh, it's, it goes back to the analogy a second ago for training. So again, I think this concept of control is, is a dated concept. That's why I preach the concept of management. So the best way to manage something is to train something, you know, what is proper, what is right, what is appropriate. Um, you know, what is the difference between your personal brand and the company's brand? What are the legal ramifications thereof and those intersections? And so to me, it's really about the training and the education. Um, you're never going to shut it down entirely. People are going to make mistakes. They're going to carry their concealed weapons, if you will, in that process. And they're going to use them inappropriately. Mm-hmm. So you might as well mitigate that as much as you possibly can and put a lot of energy into those strategies. and do the best you can in that regard. So Yeah, because I, I've seen people who have lost their jobs for posting political perspectives, um, even outside of the organization, and it somehow impacts that brand that you're talking about. Because going back to who's responsible for the brand, it's really everyone, whether you're on the clock or not. What do you think about that? Well, we do preach that everyone is in the position of sales and marketing. Um, no matter who you are. And it goes back to educating them on how their role, their task, their duty, their responsibility, whatever it might be, impacts the brand and impacts that journey process. 
So it takes a village. Certainly. And, uh, and you want the village, you know, working together <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, to achieve those mission, vision, values that you're, demo, you know, working to demonstrate within the brand itself. So let's go back and talk about strategic positioning some more. I know you mentioned the Venn diagram and you've got the three elements, which is internal, external, and competitive. Um, but now let's talk about, we talked, we, we mentioned a little bit about how my, my, my item, my, whatever I'm creating could be best in class without proving it. Let's talk more about the, your baby being ugly. There are people that come in to the market who are industry who are trying to create a business or transition away from corporate America to start their own thing. And then they have this idea of, I did this, my grandma made this for years. I'm going to market it, but it, it might taste disgusting, but this person really loves it. How do you, how do you guide the mindset of somebody creating a product or a service that is so very self-fulfilling and not necessarily wanted by everyone else? Well, I think first off, we always start by trying to understand the product, their goals, their objectives for the company, whatever it might be. Um, you know, we sort of kick things off, as I, I say, drinking from the fire hose, sucking as much information out of them as we possibly can um, in this process. And it gives us a baseline to understand uh, why they created what they created, what their passion is behind it, what they believe it does, what they believe its value propositions are, um, what, what they believe its strengths are, and even their weaknesses. We have a lot of conversations uh, about, you know, how does, this, how does this offering differentiate in the marketplace? And what are you ready for? Is it, is it in beta? Is it in alpha? Is it tested? Whatever it might be. Um, so you're going to have a conversation that starts at that tipping point to really understand them. And then essentially what you're going to do is you're going to go verify it. Um, that's at least in our minds, the right methodology. Uh, we'll, we'll go talk to customers. We'll ask them about the product. We'll ask them about the service. We'll ask them about the need for it. If they understand whether, you know, it's purpose, uh, have they, have they tried it? Have they used it? You know, whatever it might be, have they heard of it? Uh, have they not heard of it. Um, and you have to come back with the truth, the honesty um, in all of this. Because if I, as a marketer, if I am willing to stretch or lie to the point that it is truly going to, to not be held up when that individual experiences the product or the service, then I am doing the cardinal, I am committing the cardinal sin of branding, which is I am perpetuating an experience that is not positive. And therefore, I'm going to, I essentially am, I am eroding the brand in that process. So if you're not honest with yourself in this process, if you're not honest with the feedback that you receive and the data that you, you run and crunch, and you are not honest in how it's truly better or differentiated in the, in, in the market, you aren't, you aren't going to succeed because the truth will come out, you know? You can't claim you're a diverse organization if you if you've never promoted an individual or that you know to make partner or to to be responsible for something that isn't there. You can't just advertise like you are. You can't slap photos on something and pretend like it's true. Uh, you know you you can't pretend that the technology is bug free if it's not. Mm. You can't yeah. you can't pretend the product is easy to use if it's not. Um, and you can't you know. You know, taste is somewhat of a subjective, you know, there are, <laughs> there are, you know, there are DNA and genes or whatnot that affect people's taste. But at the end of the day, <laughs> it may be such a distinct taste that while it may taste negative to 99% of the marketplace, you may have a 1% niche that mm. loves it, but then you have to identify you have that to find it. Back exactly. to, you have to find that niche and market that really awful tasting thing to the people that think it's fabulous tasting <laughs> yeah. to whatever it might be. Uh, because the rest of those people are going to, they're going to, you know, buy it, hate it, tell everybody they hate it and don't yeah, buy it and, and that's trash, it. You on, trash you on your views. And then what are you going to do? Right. So that, that's why the, the marketing piece is so important is getting that positioning, you know, getting that positioning and that messaging right, getting those personas right, understanding the audiences and making sure that, you know, you need. So that's one of the first, you know, one of those first P's. And I often say you can shoot the messenger, but it won't change the message. If you want to, you know, if you want to affect people's perceptions and realities, 
you have to do something. Their reality is their reality. Your reality is your reality. Um, it is not the same. <laughs> I'm with Jonathan Fisher of BrandExtract.com. Hey, you guys, check out their website. They've got tons of free resources on branding and marketing 101. Stick around till after the break. We'll be right back to talk about when is the right time to do rebranding. Some might argue that maybe branding and advertising and marketing could actually help sway someone's opinion over to the other side well it can it can it can drive you to uh the water and sales can serve it up and you'll want to drink it but if you spit it out <laughs> and then go tell everybody at the back of the line it's man over. the water tastes terrible it's, you know oh. the line will eventually start to dwindle oh man uh, you, know, you know people will leave so <laughs> it reminds yeah. me of a trade show i went to it was a it was a cannabis trade show and they were giving out cbd water and it was the most repulsive thing i've ever put in my mouth and it didn't even look like water it was murky it was just weird but the person selling it was like so into it and such a cheerleader I'm, have you even tried this stuff <laughs> like i mean seriously how can you how can you sell something that you don't believe in well, and I think, you know, you have to be authentic. I mean, we, we preach authenticity to this process um, because in the end, the truth wins out, generally speaking, and, and, it, and it does come out. You can only deceive individuals for so long mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, the end is nigh. <laughs> well, I guess, they I guess they go into it not thinking they're deceiving yeah. anyone because they really believe this is the well, thing. They, yeah. Now they, yeah. And, and, you know, for the most part, we work with businesses that are already established. Mm -hmm. you know, there's just a lot more businesses that are out there that need our help than people that are creating something from scratch. Exactly. And generally, those that are creating from scratch have done their homework. I mean, they have, you know, built prototypes. They have tested it. They, you know, they created it out of their own understanding of the need for, them, for, for what's there, um, so their passion for it. They, you know, whether it's an invention or just a modification, innovation versus evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, so we go in, you know, for the most part, n knowing or having some sense that the product is there, that it, there's a reason that it's, it's, they're successful. They're just not as successful as they'd like to be. You know, they're, they're wanting to expand markets. They're wanting to increase price points. They're wanting to increase leads. They're wanting to increase deal size. Um, they're wanting to increase win ratios. They're wanting to decrease sales cycles, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we, do our homework to verify that we can get them into the right positioning, that we can identify the right channels, identify the right audiences, identify the right the right spends and frequencies and those touches and and all those journey processes. And we're looking for gaps. We're looking for opportunities. Yeah. Um, I'm not going in telling the company don't don't do this necessarily. Although that occasionally happens, it's extremely extremely rare. But you know, uh, it, it's it's a philosophy of you know shoot bullets, not cannonballs. I think it's. Uh, the expression that's had, been put out there um, from good to great, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I got that right. I've read so many, I've read so many books. Should I do some fact-checking? Yeah, do some fact-checking. Uh, um, I, I sometimes forget which author said what. but uh, And uh, you test, right? So you, you also don't assume that your, your ad is going to be the perfect ad or your message is the perfect message or your subject line is the perfect subject line or your form is the perfect form so there's often you know testing so if you if you have a concept you have an idea test and you know there's different ways to test a and b multivariant whatnot so um th that's what a good marketer good advertising good branding person will do is they'll they'll do their homework they'll do their research they'll do the analysis they'll do some testing they'll do refinement and they'll continually improve the process for you um that's you know it's a sign of a, of a good individual that's going to invest wisely their yeah. time it's you know we like to say there's only two things that build a brand time or money it's your time or your money <laughs> what i like about what you're doing and what agencies do in general is the whole idea of let's con let's control the message let's figure out what the message is i feel like i mean i don't know but i'm just guessing if you're a brand coming in an existing company that's coming in for support 
they might just be all over the place. And I feel like you would, or your organization would kind of like wrangle all of those things in and funnel it down into a process that's systematic to achieve a goal. What's that process like? If I were to come in today to your office with a 15 year old company and I want to increase market share, what is generally, what, how do you walk somebody through that? So, uh, I'll often start by describing our name, Brand Extract. It is both the verb and the noun. Uh, so the extraction process is pulling out what matters. Uh, you know, essentially um, removing the noise, the things that don't. Um, all the claims that you make, some of those are strategic, some of those are tactical. Um, you know, some of those are worthless, whatever it might be. Um, it's helping to identify the companies back to those those internal strengths, starting with a, essentially a SWOT discovery process um, is where we start. So we work to, to really remove the, the clutter, the, the noise um, from that process. And then we work to sort of, you know, condense and consolidate the, the distillation, if you will, down the creating the vanilla extract, the concentration portion of that process um, to get down to what matters, you know, to get down to that, that unique positioning, that unique set of messages and really build alignment. So using the internal strengths, using, using the external, um, using um, the data, using the, the research from the competition, ensuring the look, the feel, the voice, the experiences are all are all as strongly positioned as possible. So we start with an assessment or discovery um, from the vantage point of that three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. And then we present those findings and discuss those findings with the client. And they'll either, you know, believe us or they won't. <laughs> and we use verbatims. Uh, we use uh, sometimes recordings. You, you can hear the customer's voice. You can witness their experiences you can show them the testing you can there's software that tracks where the mouse goes and what they click on there's data that shows you what they visited and didn't visit and how long they spent time there um, all of that can be presented and of course at the end of the day the person can still live in denial <laughs> <laughs> to the process but generally they're going to accept the findings to a degree they may not accept a hundred percent of them but you have expanded their view of their world a little That's bit, true. hopefully a lot. Hopefully um, a lot. That's right. Well, they're coming yeah. to you because they want something. So they've got to have some level of openness to it, right? You would hope. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, there are a few things that are occasionally sacred that no matter how much you tell them, they're not going to believe you. Yeah. Uh, they're just going to stick with them until they, they're going to, it'll be the sword they die on, whatever right. it might be. And so you do your best to work around those situations yes. when you can. Um, but you know, I feel like you have to be really candid and you have to be very honest. And, and sometimes the, me sometimes the message isn't a hundred percent positive, but if you present it the right way, if you present it as an opportunity, look, they gave you this feedback because they care about you and they want to see you succeed. I mean, when you're doing interviews, for example, I like to say those that love you will jump in the process out of the gate and they'll be very quick to want to talk to us and support you. Those that have a chip on their shoulder will also be very quick to jump in because they want to complain to somebody and they also want it fixed in that regard. And they're just, you know, they've got a beef. They want to voice it. They just feel better. It's, it's like getting mm -hmm. on the couch, you know, couch and, you know, calling it therapy. <laughs> um, you're in trouble when they don't care enough either way. Oh. That is a big red flag to us. So if we're doing outreach, trying to get customers to engage and talk to us about us, about you, and they are not passionate one way or the other, that is a bigger problem, you know? So, so relish the opportunity that they care, that they are willing to complain. Take that as a positive because you can do something with it. Mm -hmm. You can't fix what you don't know is broke. Wow. You know, so. So you, you mentioned SWAT. What is a SWAT for those who are listening? strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay. And so, you know, you can put everything in one of those boxes, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then I I think recently I heard two T's on the end, the last one being trends. What do you think? Trends? Strengths, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and trends. 
Well, I think I, I would put trends as either it can be an opportunity, something that's that's coming up, um, and it can be a threat because they're moving away from the thing you sell or do or that they care about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're adopting a new technology and yours isn't updated, whatever it might be. Um, all of these can be, they can change category depending upon what you do. Uh, what might be a strength today is is a weakness in the future. Uh, if the competition comes out tomorrow with something that's the better mousetrap, bigger, better, faster, disruptive, then what was a strength is no longer a strength. So the thing you have to remember, and this goes back to the concept of managing, is that you know a brand is a living thing. You don't set it and forget it. You know, mm-hmm. That's why it's not just the logo. And even identities age out. You know, The brands have to be tended to. They have to be nurtured. They have to be maintained. They are continual investments because you're continually working to improve that and manage that brand experience process that's there. So as far as financial investment, like, or time investment, how often should a company revisit their branding? Certain components last longer than others. (laughs) Let me put it that way. Um, you should always be monitoring the brand. You should always be managing the brand. So to me, it's an evergreen process. Um, however, if you're asking about, say, just a logo, for example, you know, logos uh, often get refreshed or modified slightly, um, generally after a decade or more. Um, if you look at go back and look at hundred year old companies or even you know thirty or forty year old companies, um, I would say that as of late um, in the last three decades that cycle has shortened, especially for if you think about the dot com boom of the nineties. Um, um, companies that are evolving their brands more often, but essentially identities used to stand for a fairly long, fairly long period of time, and then they'd get slight modifications redrawn a little bit, you know, the deer would be jumping up, the deer would be jumping down, the deer would be hand drawn, the deer would be flat graphic, whatever it might be, if you're thinking about something like a John Deere tractor brand, um, or Starbucks brand, you know, original, the original mermaid logo, um, simplified over time. Um, So uh, websites tend not to last more than four or five years from their base code. Um, I have built sites that are lasted 10 years, but that's pre-smartphone. So you think about all the technology and the bandwidth and the browser changes, you, you know, you, if you're getting four or five, six years out of your site without really overhauling it, you're doing pretty good these days. Um, but if you can afford to constantly work on the site, to constantly keep it up, then you're going to do better. Those experiences are not going to age out and the competition will not leapfrog you in that process. Um, so, you know, um, so the systems, the artifacts, if you will, of the brand, um, you know, the voice of the brand tends not to change. If you get the positioning right, the positioning will last a very long time, uh, barring disruptive technologies or massive trend shifts in the marketplace. Um, you see energy transition is a huge trend in the marketplace right now, decarbonization. Um, so, you know, that's just something companies are going to be forced to adopt to. ESG reporting is a massive trend right now for public and private companies, um, it's it's basically become something that they cannot avoid doing. Um, Environmental? Environmental, social, and governance reporting, right? Um, And so so companies before that might not have cared about it or did it and didn't realize that they were doing it are now having to do it because the supply chain is demanding that they, they be responsible within it and want to know, and it can give them a competitive advantage. And so companies that see a trend can jump on the trend, mm. provided it is the right trend, mm-hmm. and and take advantage of it and 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 be a first mover or create competitive differentiation by doing it in, in such a way. Now, you don't want to just greenwash something. Again, that's sort of like lying. It's, it's yeah. not going to be true. Yeah. And, and people will see through it, and they'll call you on it. So you can't just, you know, make up your data and pretend like you're doing it. It'll get you into trouble. It reminds me of like the rebranding you're talking about reminds me uh, what everything you're saying. All I keep thinking about is like the soda brands like Sprite. Uh, I saw a Sprite bottle. Remember when we had Diet Coke? Now it's <laughs> zero sugar. So that kind of rebrand is interesting because it took me by surprise. Um, is that because they're trying to go after maybe a different market? Maybe the younger people um, 
are trying to go, they don't like the word diet for a negative connotation. I don't know. I'm just guessing. What do you think about that kind of rebranding? Well, um, I would say that it might be because certain terms have fallen out of favor occasionally, or they can take on new meaning because of some cultural shift in the marketplace. Um, it, it can literally be chemistry. Uh, there can be new science behind something. Science, people think science is fact and it's only fact until the science is evolved right? until you learn something new, you know, everybody was, you know, really frustrated with what the what was being put out on reports for COVID, but they were still testing. They were still learning, you know, the, the virus was mutating. <laughs> um, so, you know, science is a process more than, and, uh, but you do have to accept, yeah, well, accept it, that it's real. It, it fooled me because someone gifted me a, a zero sugar seven up. I think it was. And I'm, I poured it and I'm looking at the label. I'm like, that looks exactly like a diet, like all the chemicals and everything, right? It looks exactly like a diet, diet drink. What's the difference? And I like, I really had an aha, like what's going on? Like I'm a (laughs) generational gap thing, I think. Maybe they're just targeting a younger audience. Well, and, and different, you know, different stakeholders are coming at, going to come at it from their different vantage points. That's why you develop personas. Um, you often have multiple buyers. Buyers buy for multiple reasons. Um, and some are emotional, some are rational, um, you know, left brain, right brain kind of philosophy that's there. Um, so they are looking at who their target demographics is. They are looking at what their decision process is like. They're looking at what their goals are like, and they are positioning accordingly at, and assuming the position is correct and accurate and they're not lying. <laughs> that's just, you know, faking the labels, whatever it might be. Um, so what's a persona? I'll give you an example. Um, my brother has a winery and he wants, he, he reached out to a marketing professional to, I guess, help him with something. I don't know the details of what he was asking, but he says, man, all I want to do is create personas. And he was so turned off by it. He could, he doesn't understand the process of it. How do you explain a persona and what's the benefit of going through that process? So our, defi- our persona is generally defining kind of the um, the buyer's firmographic and demographic type of uh, decisions and data that they are out there. So let's use wine as an example. So you may have a persona where uh, the persona would be considered a wine aficionado, and they know a lot about wine. They've drunk a lot of wine. They they might be uh, uh, a, an aficionado that has high cash value, so they purchase a lot or purchase very expensive wine. Um, another persona might be somebody who just wants a decent bottle to take to the party and not be embarrassed. Hmm. Another persona might be somebody who wants to go into the store and buy something to drink with friends and they don't have a lot of money and they're in their twenties and they just want to have fun. Mm -hmm. And so the personas are defined as who these kind of um, characters, if you will, um, of categories of buyers might be. Um, If it's somebody purchasing a vehicle, are they a sports enthusiast? Are they environmentalist? Are they, um, you know, uh, fuel, you know, fuel efficient uh, type persona, safety efficient personas. So people take positions in the marketplace and the reason the persona is important is because it is the definition of the buyer that they are going after for that positioning. Um, It's very hard to occupy lots of positions at the same time with the same product. So that's why companies create different product lines or product extensions is to go after those different personas often. You know, uh, I think BMW will take the position of driving performance. They're going after that 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 car aficionado that loves, you know, thinks of themselves as a race driver more or less. Um, whereas Volvo has taken the position of safety historically, and you know, uh, tried to create this persona that they are the safest car out there. And so, so the the two buyers are likely not going to cross all that much. But there are buyers that want tremendous performance and tremendous safety and, and that out there. And so companies will try and split the baby, you know, so to speak. But you can only <laughs> sort of you can only sort of jam in so much. Uh, you have to really take a position. And um, I like to 
think of it as occupying, uh, planting your flag on the mountain, if you will. Uh-huh. You know, uh, you only get, I like to tell clients, you really just get one flag for this product or this service. So, you, you know, we need oh, to be Oh, really, I like that. You know, you think about it, but there are multiple personas within the process. So for example, you can have somebody with veto power, somebody with purchasing power, somebody with decision or influencing power. So you can have multiple personas within the buying process itself. So don't think of it as a completely singular approach. Um, you know, if they're a software company, IT may have uh, influence or veto, but purchasing may still have final say, or the CEO may be the influencer, or the VP may be the influencer of that group, or the 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 people that use the software may be the influencer when they may they may weigh heavily on the decision making process. So in B two B. Um, which is really the space we play more in, uh, there's often multiple stakeholders and you develop different personas for different stakeholders that are going to be involved in that process of what you're trying to market. But, you know, in, in general, the persona helps you get the messaging. It helps you figure out what to say. It helps you think about how they're going to engage with the product. What are their activities? What are they going to do first? What are they going to do last? How are they going to think? What do you want them to feel? So getting those personas right is important because then you're basing all those other activities off of that. So should that happen inside the organization or is that something that you would recommend outsourcing that exercise? Well, there's, there's talented people that do this at work inside organizations. Um, if you've never done it, you might have a little bit harder time doing it. You probably could teach yourself to do it, but yeah, you might want to go work with somebody on the outside that does it for a living to help you figure it out. If someone has a marketing department, when should they outsource services or support from you? How do they know when to, how do people know when to come to you? Or when do you want people to come to you? Let's put it that way. (laughs) So, um, We focus on three things, creating brands, transforming brands, and growing brands in the marketplace. If they're looking to create a brand from scratch, nothing exists. Maybe they have a name. Maybe they don't have a name, but they got to build it from scratch. That's a great time to come to us. Uh, uh, Most internal groups are not super experienced at creating brands from scratch because most companies don't create brands from scratch every single day. You know, so if you, you may work inside an organization, I'm sure there are a few organizations that are highly dynamic, but by and large, the, the vast majority of the millions of companies out there are not producing a new brand every single day. Um, so uh, generally on the inside, uh, the people on the inside are not that experienced with creating these brands from scratch. And so they often come to organizations like ours to get that expert insight into the process and either double check or help guide them through the process. Um, by the same token, they're also not used to transforming a brand every single day. Um, They've kind of worked in the company, the brand's been the brand since they got there, or maybe they came in and they helped evolve it once. And it's been that way for five, six, seven, 10 years, whatever it's been that they've been there. So again, people on the inside are generally not that experienced at repositioning or fixing a negative brand um, or a broken brand in some way and transforming it. So they generally come to companies like ours, which are doing it day in and day out and have done it hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. in that process. So that's like, you know, a huge chunk of what we're doing with companies is when they're thinking about solving something that they don't do every day is a good time to think about calling a company like ours. Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're not here to replace what they do every day. If they do it successfully, great. But if they're doing something and it's not working, or they think they can get more out of it, or they'd like a second opinion, then by all means, give us a call. We really want to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we can help them achieve or fix those, you know, whatever it is that they're looking for, for those goals. Uh, Often we get calls uh, on the growth side of things when a company has a brand and a product and it's been largely successful, but they are trying to, uh, like I say, put rocket fuel in the car, make it go faster, make it go farther, make it go someplace it's never gone before. And they're just not sure how to get there. Mm. Um, Maybe they've been working with somebody an agency in the past has done a decent job for them, but isn't giving them the new ideas that they're looking for, isn't giving them a, a fresh perspective, isn't giving them enough fuel. Like they're just inching the car a little bit faster as they go. And it's like, okay, you know, maybe they're overdoing it. Even in some cases, as we say, using sledgehammers to drive thumbtacks, 
you know, the ROI is, yeah, they're, they're getting a return, but the return ratios are ridiculous, you know, so they're spending 300% what they should be to get the customer. Um, and they're huh. trying to figure out a smarter way to do it. Wow. So if they're um, even tracking that at all, if they're even tracking at all, a lot of times mm -hmm. they're not, yeah. um, a, a good way to, to understand whether, you know, whether a company is biased in this process is to understand how the company makes money. Yeah. Um, if they survive off of media commissions, then they're probably going to steer you in the path of spending money that drives media. Yeah, if they survive off of PR, then I pretty much can guarantee you PR will be the pill they sell you. That's the most pills that you're going to receive in the prescription. Mm -hmm. uh, because without it, they can't survive as an entity. So you want you want to look at the bias of their process, and to the degree that they are more channel agnostic or more service agnostic, the more likely it is you're going to get an unvarnished method or a, a channel that isn't over prescribed in the process. If that makes sense. So so think of it as you know if they're trying to create something, if they're trying to transform, if they're trying to grow something. And they just aren't comfortable with where they're at or who they're working with. Um, that's when they should come and talk to us because we'd be happy to help them through that. Jonathan, it has been so much fun having you on the show. I love all of our conversations every time we talk. It's so enlightening. And I'm sure our listeners are really pumped up now and looking forward to your next episode. Check it out. He's right after this show. There's another episode with Jonathan. And to learn more about Jonathan, check him out on LinkedIn, Jonathan Fisher, or check out his company's website, brandextract.com. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. It's been an honor. I, you know, I've already done a few interviews and I'm going back to edit and it's reminds me so much of like, um, uh, what's that, what is that? A uh, masterclass kind yeah. of stuff. It reminds me like Matt, they're all like, all of these have been like the way they've been edited are like masterclass content. You know, it's not just a podcast. It's like truly like a seminar. It's, it's really cool. I'm really, really proud of it. And, um, it's only because we've got great people coming on, you know, it's nothing to do with me. It's all about the guests. Yeah. Well, there's so. a lot of talented people out there and it's amazing, you know, you're doing a huge service by finding them and, and giving them a, you know, a chance to kind of share some of their ideas. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, please subscribe to Making It to Market wherever you listen to podcasts or listen from our website, makingittomarket.com. Thank you for your honest five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And a special thanks to our listeners and show sponsors. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to do this. As you know, Making It to Market is a new show and I need your help to get the word out. Feel free to share links to your favorite episodes. You don't want to miss the next one. If there's a topic you'd like to hear, have a comment, or even have a question you'd like for me to address, feel free to leave me a voice message on our podcast phone line. If we air your question or comment in an upcoming episode, we'll send you a Making It to Market t-shirt or mug. Details are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, make decisions that make a difference.